Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I think we are going to continue live stream because we have more people on live streams than we have here. So, um, um, Michael, I can see you in the room. Can I ask those who have questions or comments to raise their hands and make those comments? Um, especially those who are not. Yeah, go ahead. Torah, did you want to ask? I saw your camera. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to change security, but please note that this is live stream. So if you don't want your face on Facebook and you are in this meeting, please make sure you close your camera. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Yasama. Thank you, Comrade Roberts, for an excellent talk. I wanted just to follow on from where Yasaman left uh, her questions. Uh, what do you think of this tariff war, which is, you know, gradually uh, getting hotter and hotter, uh, especially in this situation where, as you said, world trade is going through a period of a stagnation and decline? Uh, how is this tariff war going to affect that? and affect the economies of even the major uh, capitalist countries themselves. Uh, go ahead, Michael. I've made you uh, co-host, so you should be able to speak. Go ahead. Yep, I can see and hear you. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah. OK, well, um, thank you, Toro, for the question. Yes, well, uh, this is all part of uh, two uh, aspects, I think, of what's happening in the world. Namely, um, firstly, the decline of globalization, the expansion of world trade has meant that many of the major economies are looking to their own needs against the interests of perhaps world cooperation on trade and so on. Uh, as Marx once said, capitalists will combine against um, the labor force in the countries and see themselves as brothers, but they can become hostile brothers if the uh, amount of profit they can get out of workers begins to become more difficult to raise, and they will start fighting amongst themselves for that share of that profit. And that applies on the tr international trade level, that when there was a general expansion of international trade and of capital flows around the world, then we saw a lot of reduction in tariffs uh, and in quotas, and the World Trade Organization was a became an, a body which uh, was supposed to settle disputes between countries over tariffs and trade restrictions and generally get agreements to reduce those restrictions. And over the period from the 1970s up until the end of the uh, 20th century, we saw a significant reduction in tariffs, particularly in the manufacturing and industrial sector, but also even to some extent in service services sectors. But of course, that has changed in the 21st century, particularly after the Great Recession, with the slowdown in the world economy, and particularly in trade and in capital flows to not only the global south from the imperialist north, but also generally there's been a decline in, in capital flows. So now we get a turning inwards uh, towards trying to protect uh, national economies against international competition. So it's not just the United States who have been proposing big increases in tariffs, starting with Donald Trump's increases in his first uh, period of presidency uh, between after 2016, but also in other countries as well, we've seen the rise in tariff protection and tariffs in general as a result of this change in policy. The other side of the coin is, of course, that it's particularly in the case of the United States and its allies, tariff restrictions and other quotas and other sanctions against uh, trade is aimed now at China because China is seen as the serious rival uh, to Amer American hegemony in the world, uh, is sucking up most of the manufacturing production in the world. It's dominating in trade, particularly in goods, and it is now beginning to establish its position in higher value added products like semiconductors and other technologies which America 
and the Global North had uh, a dominant uh, share of in the past. And that's beginning to change. This is very frightening to American imperialism. And so part of the war, uh, a Cold War at the moment against China, is based on tariff measures to begin with. And when Donald Trump wins the election in November, which looks likely now, he is proposing not only that uh, be a further increase in tariffs, but a massive increase in tariffs across the board against all countries, but particularly against Chinese imports, uh, in return for which he's going to reduce taxes uh, for corporations and rich individuals in America. So the tariff weapon is now not only one which as a result of the change in the economic situation globally, but also become a political issue for many governments, but particularly for the US uh, and also for that as part of the US uh, leading ruling elite that wants to reduce taxes for the rich. It's looking for a way out of that by raising tariffs and other measures against uh, Chinese trade and other countries' trade as well. Thanks very much. I have uh, Siomak on the list, and then I have a question. Siomak, be aware that if you open your video, it will go live. Um, and then I have a question in text. Go ahead, Siomak. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'll close my uh, video. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Nords, for your informative um, talk, and especially on Iran. Uh, my question, actually, uh, it's a bit comparing historical um, facts and data. Um, I don't remember just before 2007 and 2008 uh, crisis if IMF or World Bank had released um, such a gloomy and dark um, situation of the world economy, but but also like this, the question is an implication. Like, it looks like from what I remember, it's not as bad as you know, two thousand seven and two thousand eight prediction. Right? Um, I might be wrong. That's what I'm asking. But even that time, like when we had such a uh, you know a financial meltdown, um, we saw nothing really much happened except you know we've had some uh, in the western um, countries some occupational movements uh, occupy certain places um, as well as um, some you know bigger movements in the terrible countries but we didn't really see anything a serious threat to the global capitalism being developed so um so why should we, from you know socialist uh, revolution socialist perspective, um, think this this is more serious? Maybe it's not serious. I'm asking that's that's my question. Um, but also, I have a second question. It's it's about the uh, cryptocurrency and what is your opinion on? Uh, serious of this ending because there's you know as you know there's a talk on uh, possibly as a threat to uh, dollar hegemony uh, u.s hegemony and what i wanted to ask your opinion uh, on that thank you very much yeah thanks go ahead well well see Mac, um if you remember during the presentation you've just seen i showed some graphs which showed that uh, after each of the major crises, they talked about the 2007-8 crisis and, of course, the 2020 pandemic slump, which were huge drops in production and investment and trade across the world. We haven't seen anything like that at all, uh, really, in the history of capitalism, not only in the depth, uh, but also in the scope right across 95%, 99%, I think, of countries suffered uh, during those two big slumps as a result and, and contracted in production and investment. But after those, what we saw is a, is a recovery, but a recovery at a much lower level. Growth rates were slower than they were before each of the, those slumps. And in many cases, the trajectory of recovery hasn't brought 
uh, many countries back to the same level they had before those slumps, or if it has, they, th there's been a significant loss uh, between where they could have been uh, if they had not had those slumps before 2007-8. There was a growth rate, if you like, in the world of around 3.5% um, in the major economies. And then after 2008, up until the pandemic slump, the growth rate was less than that, something like 25 and since then, at least in the major economies, excluding uh, the global south big boys like um, China or India, growth rates have been even slower. So in 2007-8, the IMF, World Bank and other people were not expecting a massive slump like that. There was a, a not expecting the financial meltdown that took place. And so it was a resulting shock uh, to the international agencies and to mainstream economists. But after that, then the view was, well, we mustn't let that happen again. So we've seen a big expansion in central bank uh, quantitative easing, it's called pumping money into the credit, into the economy. And also even to some extent after a while, uh, government spending as well being raised. All those are attempts to avoid a further slump. We still had that slump in 2020. Uh, that uh, was again a shock to the world because it came from an unexpected source out of uh, a pathogen, uh, a virus which infected the world and forced because governments could not cope uh, to close down their economies for a period of time. And since then, the view is now increasingly the case that amongst the international agencies that they have a more pessimistic or if you like more realistic view about the ability of capitalism to grow. So they've changed their views from being very optimistic before 2007, eight to a period of hoping for recovery during the 2010s, which they didn't get. And now a period of general worry that the major economies are not growing the way they could do to meet the needs of people around the world. Productivity growth is lower, investment growth is lower. And as I showed in my presentation, the World Bank, for example, sees the rest of this decade is a really de depressed one, and particularly for the, the uh, global South countries. So there is a change in the attitude of uh, the international agencies than we've uh, seen before. So I, it, it's not, I think that's the way I was trying to pose it to you, that um, that mood uh, or that view amongst the international agencies is a result of real events of hit that hit the world economy, which they are forced to recognize and consider. Of course, they still hope that they will get out of this by various means, which uh, we could discuss. But on the whole, they're looking rather pessimistically about things uh, over the rest of this decade, at least. Um, we could discuss how they could get out of that, but we haven't done that in this particular uh, section. Uh, cryptocurrencies is, is, is put forward as one possibility of getting out of it, if you like. The idea is that um, this, uh, as it were, digital currency, which is no longer under the control, it's not a currency that is generated by states, by governments, as part of a unit of count in their country, or even internationally by the IMF. This is a, a currency, these are currencies which are created autonomously by individuals or by groups of individuals without any control of the government and they are entirely digital and depend on a particular digital uh, formulation and uh, technology, which allows them to generate these uh, crypto units. Has, do, they, do they offer an alternative to national currencies, to fiat currencies, that is government currencies, in particular the US dollar, as it becomes weaker? Well, I don't think so. Uh, certainly not for the average person like ourselves. We are not going to be using any form of cryptocurrency to replace the pound or the uh, Iranian currency or the American dollar and so on. Those, the national currencies controlled by national governments and central banks can, will continue to be the currencies of exchange and transaction, not only amongst individuals, but also at the level of trade. What cryptocurrencies have become is basically another speculative asset, like gold has become a speculative asset by people who buy gold because they don't want to hold national currencies. So people buy cryptocurrencies and the expectation that they're going to massively increase. And you've noticed in the recent uh, period of crises, for example, um, uh, with the news of Trump's assassination, near assassination, 
there was a massive increase in cryptocurrency prices. They're seen as an escape place to take your uh, money out of dollars or whatever you hold it into, into a currency that's going to gain. But of course, at the end of the day, they have to go back into some national currency, otherwise they can't be used. So they are an asset uh, like art, like property, like gold, which people speculate in at the moment as an, a simple one that they can carry out with all the risks that a speculative asset has that you can lose all your money. And cryptocurrencies have been very, very volatile, rocketing upwards and rocketing downwards. That's not a, an alternative to the everyday transactions of international trade or of people exchanging monies for their personal accounts that could replace the existing fiat currencies. Very much. I have a question in text, so I'm going to read it out. Regarding the relationship between the countries of global south, such as uh, China and South Africa, with countries of the periphery, such as Iran, how would you describe the relationship? Is this an imperialist relationship or how would you define the relationship between, I'm not sure about South Africa, but I'm just reading the question, mm -hmm. the relationship between China and South Africa with countries such as Iran? Yeah, well, the, my view of how to define imperialism is first of all an economic one. There are aspects to imperialism, but the fundamental one economically is that imperialism exists it's a transfer of huge amounts of profit surplus value on a regular and persistent basis from the poorer weaker less technology developed countries to the advanced capitalistic countries with higher technology levels and they can make, get those transfers of, sur of surplus value or profit through trade being able to control and defeat uh, in a whole range of products, the majority of products produced in the world that people use and services are actually uh, produced at a better cost or lower cost by the imperialist companies and therefore able, able to extract most of the profits that come out of that. That's one way, trade. And also by, by investing in the poorer countries of the world, controlling sectors of the economy and transferring profit, interest and rent even back to, to the global north of the imperialist countries. And the studies that I have done with my colleague Guglielmo Cogheri show that, and other studies by other scholars, Marxist scholars, have shown that that sort of level of transfer can be something like 3% of GDP per year for the uh, to add to the advanced capitalist economy's uh, growth, general level of GDP. So it's quite a significant proportion. And for many of the global south countries, it's even higher, a big transfer of resources, profits comes out of their countries through trade, through these multinational companies working in their countries, through the banks, back to the global north. So I start with an economic definition. There are other things that are involved in uh, imperialism. The military fa fa factor, of course, is very important as well. Uh, the control of the world's uh, uh, territories through military bases and so on. Imperialism. For example, US imperialism has something like 750 basis internationally around the world and China has I think two so if you want to measure it in military terms China is not an imperialist country if you want to measure it in economic terms it's not an imperialist country too because the transfers most of the transfers that take place of value are out of China into the US and into the global north is there a transfer significant transfer of value from weaker countries like South Africa from to China uh, some people have argued that South Africa takes a lot of Chinese investment and therefore they're being exploited. Chinese, the Chinese are exploiting the South African economy and the South African workers in the same way that imperialist countries are. In my view, the, the level of exploitation on that argument is very low compared to the role of the West and Europe in South Africa and the control of that economy by the imperialist countries. So... I don't see China as an imperialist country or a significant exploiter of South Africa. Uh, and you could argue that, in fact, it's the other way around in the sense that at least China is providing 
important infrastructure projects to the South Africans and to other countries. And as we've just been talking about the possibility that they could uh, do so with for Iran, uh, rather than some exploitative force, uh, which is now another imperialist power alongside the G7 imperialist powers that we have at the moment. This is highly debatable. People will disagree. Uh, socialists and Marxists would disagree and say that China is an imperialist country. I spend quite some time arguing in academic circles uh, about this. But that's the argument I would present to suggest that it's not the case. And so we're not talking about the same relationship uh, between China and South Africa as we're talking about the relationship between the G7 economies and South Africa. Thanks very much. I have, I think, the last question. If anyone else has any questions, please put them in text. Dostan Rofaraike soal daram. Be Farsi ya ingilisi mitouni tuye text benevisi. So our uh, very good friend Nilofar has asked this. First of all, she says thank you very much for a very fruitful presentation. Based on the data and the analysis you have provided, what is your best estimate regarding the overall sustainability of capitalism, that in the long term? Do you think we should wait for a new phase of capitalism after the present so-called neoliberalism or even anticipate a possible collapse? I'll add something to this. Both in US, uh, where there was an ultra-right conference, if I understand it, last week, there were um, uh, one of my friends, Susan Schneider, has kindly put uh, some debates about the economic policies putting for put forward during that ultra-right conference. And she's arguing that the alt-right is actually moving away from neoliberal economic policies. Um, I wondered if you could combine my question and Nilofar's question and make some comments. Thanks very much. Yes, well, on the question of uh, neoliberalism, as I understand it, that in the past, that's a period of perhaps since the early 1980s, the argument is that we don't need the, the state being involved in the market economy, let the market economy free to uh, carry out its activities. And in this way, uh, economies will grow because there'll be a free competition free, free, and there'll be free trade. It will be an open, up, open door. We will ensure that there's deregulations and privatization so that the state is weakened, the trade unions are weakened, and that the whole process of economic growth will return to depending on the demands and the vicissitudes of the market in some sort of mystical idea of perfect competition operating. When, of course, we know there's no such thing as perfect competition. We have massive monopolies. We have lots of irregularities. Some countries are much more powerful and technologically based than others. They have military power. There is no equality between countries or between companies. And so this idea of free competition under the neoliberal idea with no state involved as, is an illusion. And it, it cracked apart, as we've seen, particularly after the Great Recession in 2007-8. Uh, and we've seen over, really over the last 15 years an increasing uh, recognition that this idea doesn't work. And what has it led to? Well, in the case of the, 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 the right wing, is, and we see that not just in the United States, but in Europe too, the idea that free trade is not a good idea, that uh, letting the um, big monopolies control uh, the economy is not a good idea. Uh, what we need is protection of our nation state against others, particularly immigrants and particularly people we don't like. We need uh, an end of uh, international agreements like the European Union or uh, international group of world trade organization we need to move towards protection to a national nationalist view about how to organize uh, a competition based on a strategy organized with by the nation against other nations and if necessary uh, that would lead to conflict if we if it means that we cannot get our way 
So this is the real danger that the hard right or the, uh, the right wing wants to pull forward. They're not putting forward an alternative for the, the, for the needs of the world's population. They're putting forward an alternative for what the ruling class should do in their own country to defend their interests because it's no longer possible for the interests of all the ruling class internationally to be met because of the increasing difficulty in the world economy. So we're getting a more extreme protectionist nationalist wing of the bourgeois coming out. And of course, behind that lies a fascist wing that the only way this policy could possibly be implemented properly would be the crushing of trade unionism, of democratic rights and so on, as we saw in the 1930s. And that's where the direction of that is going. Can capitalism get out of this mess? Because the economies are not doing well. We have a growing nationalist, semi-fascist development taking place. It seems that the labor movement is still relatively weak. Because from our point of view, the only way capitalism can really get out of this is to get rid of capitalism, which is to develop a socialist alternative, both nationally and internationally. But can capitalism itself get out of it? Well, there are some possibilities. Uh, they're hoping that artificial intelligence will bring about a sufficient huge jump in productivity and these new technologies which will become available will reduce the amount of labor force that we will need around the world in particular areas and will span productivity dramatically so that the profits of the of the those companies which adopt artificial intelligence will dramatically rise enabling capitalist economies to grow much faster than we've seen over the last uh, 20 odd years in the 21st century well that is an open open debate in my view, uh, it's a bit of a, uh, is putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse in that artificial intelligence will not be implemented unless the profitability of artificial intelligence is sufficiently high. But it's actually profitability, as I showed in one of the graphs, is very low worldwide. And it's difficult to turn that around uh, straight away. In fact, some estimates say that most big technologies that could transform the world, like electricity or personal computers or uh, railways in the past have taken something like two decades or more to really be fully implemented and have an Im impact in an economy. So we're just at the beginning of AI, if it's going to be such a big technology, that's still doubtful. And so 20 years is a long way uh, ahead to see whether capitalism can turn itself around while we have these other dangerous reactionary forces where, which you're talking about developing on the one hand. So it's going to be to a very difficult period for capitalism and that means a very difficult period too for us in the labor movement and for working people around the world the situation is reaching a serious extreme of conflict as we've seen between nations and also within countries the next decade is going to be a very decisive and worrying one and we can only hope it comes in the right direction for all of us Okay, thanks very much. Tora, you're next. I'm, we're not going to keep you too long, but Tora has another question. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Tora. Uh, maybe he's a bit irrelevant to the debate yeah. tonight, but uh, I thought it could be interesting in the sense that Labour government, which has just been elected in England, has uh, put forward a policy for growth. They have said our major and main emphasis would be growth and growth and growth. First of all, how serious is this policy? Is it, uh, does it have any meat or is it just, you know, verbiage in the sense of would it have any effect, major effects on British economy? Uh, and secondly, if it is serious, uh, because calls for, you know, a state intervention for growth has come about in USA itself. Biden, for example, with his infrastructure, you know, investment started a popular front in France, which got the biggest share of the votes, uh, has also proposed a similar, uh, you know, plan for a state intervention for growth coming out of austerity and, uh, you know, last 20 years of, you know, a stagnation. Uh, if it is serious, then Labour's policy, and it could have an effect, 
how uh, how could it influence some of the uh, sort of currents within the G7 countries uh, towards a new path rather than this, you know, free market, you know, just rich get richer, you know, uh, monetary easing for the rich not to collapse, uh, whilst, you know, we pay more taxes and more inflation, et cetera, et cetera. How, how, how do you envisage this uh, period in Britain? Well, yes, uh, the, the new government says that it, its most important message is that we're going to have growth. We're going to aim for growth. And it's going to be a joint effort between workers and business to get better growth, higher growth. Uh, but what is their actual strategy for achieving this? What's their industrial strategy, as the modern phrase, of, or the phrase that's appeared in the last few years, uh, for achieving this? Their answer is not really actually so much state intervention, certainly not state investment. Their projection for state investment is actually as a percentage of gross product, according to other experts, not just the, the new government, is actually going to be lower at the end of this parliament, not higher. Their plan is to use a little bit of public money as a seed corn to encourage the private sector to invest more. So they see the idea of reducing regulations for the private sector, giving them a bit of subsidy help to get going, keeping taxes down for the private sector. Uh, the Labour government has said that they're not going to raise taxes. In fact, they are prepared to cut business taxes further in order to encourage the private sector. So their idea of achieving growth is through the private sector, through private investment, the expansion of the, of the private sector and the companies involved there, not through state intervention particularly, except in the sense of subsidising uh, the private sector. In some ways, that is similar to Bidenomics. That's similar to Biden's programme. Yes, they put money in uh, directly to try and boost certain sectors of the economy, certainly conductors and so on. But mainly that money is tax exemptions, tax allowances, subsidies to the big uh, semiconductor companies to build a manufacturing plant to develop that. And there's been a huge expansion of manufacturing plants for semiconductors and so on, partly as a policy to break away from China too. Uh, but it hasn't really spread across the rest of the US economy. The US economy is growing at under 2% at the moment, so its productivity is still very, very low. I think the same result will happen with the UK economy if you have an industrial strategy which is based on trying to stimulate the private sector rather than replacing the private sector with public investment and state direct, directed and led and planned uh, investment involving working people, which is much more of a, if you like, a socialist alternative. This Labour government does not believe in such a socialist alternative. It believes in the capitalist sector. It manage, is trying to get it to work better, to manage it better on industrial strategy. I don't think that policy has worked in the past. And I'd be amazed at the end of this parliament uh, for the UK government in 2029 is we will see any dramatic improvement in the growth rates of the UK economy, unless, of course, there is a general improvement in the world economy's growth rates. Otherwise, I see no particular change at all uh, despite this talk about growth. I'm going to make a last call for any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. There is a, there's one last question. Sorry, uh, mm. Michael. So someone has asked, I'd like to know what you think the global, how you think the global market would react in the event of Trump's election in the forthcoming US presidential elections, given the context of the current crisis? Well, let, let me say global market, the two aspects to a global market in capitalism, there's the stock market, the financial markets, how will they react? And this will perhaps more importantly, uh, what will happen uh, to the global economy if we have Trump at the head of the US? Well, as I said, uh, we'll take the economy first. Well, now let's take the market. Let's take the financial market. So the financial market is unclear about whether Trump is going to be good news or bad news. It's good news in some ways that they see that corporation taxes, business taxes could be cut, that uh, the people who run these companies and the companies themselves will not pay as much tax as they have done, not that they pay a huge amount anyway. 
and that they see that Trump is going to allow them to uh, ride roughshod against environmental regulations and planning regulations, which, which restrict their ability to expand their uh, industries and, and therefore increase their profits because uh, there are regulations in order to protect us from the environment and from the climate crisis. Trump is not interested in uh, preserving any of the investments that are necessary on renewables and so on to try and curb the impending disastrous climate crisis. He's going to let that rip. So in some ways, big business likes that. Of course, they also worry that Trump is a very, very unpredictable person. He's considering massive tariff uh, impositions across the rest of the world and imports, imports that American industry needs. Uh, a, a large section of, of imports for American industry, not just for consumers, come from Chinese production, Chinese components and so on. It's not easy to replace those. If Trump's going to make them incredibly expensive through tariffs, that will increase their difficulties, lower their profitability. So uh, the, the attitude of the markets is somewhat uncertain. Uh, about whether it's going to be good news for Trump uh, being in president or not. Um, the last time was in many ways pretty disastrous uh, for American imperialism and for the companies. So they were worried about this time, although maybe it'll be a little different. As for the rest of the world, this can only be bad news because Trump is going to try and reduce the ability for the world to increase its trade and its production and try to hog the resources and the surplus value that the human that the people are creating around the world for the United States through these various uh, nationalist and protectionist measures. He's going to continue a very concerted and persistent campaign to isolate, crush and curb China. He will increase investments and military support for Taiwan and all the allies in that area if he has to in order to uh, restrict China's ability to grow. Uh, you might, he might, but I, I'm not sure, uh, try to end the Ukraine-Russia war with some sort of deal so they can concentrate on China. So that's a maybe that's a plus if that happens, but it will be replaced by an even bigger minus by his campaigns um, in the Pacific area, which will continue with renewed vigour, I think, um, by the, if he is in office the next time. So this is a period where the economy in America is going to, be very uncertain about the direction that things are going to go and the global economy is going to suffer if there's massive uh, reductions increases in tariffs and therefore reductions in trade and output particularly for the global south and then there's the serious danger of military conflict in against china and other conflicts in that area which uh, trump could provoke so if it's the next four years of trump is not a good one for the world although i'd have to say if biden was one. I'm not sure that would be any better. Thanks very much on this not so optimistic view of the world. Um, any other, I can't see any raised hands or any text. If I'm missing something, others should tell me. Um, I want to tell you that this was a very useful session not just because of the way you describe the world economy, but the attention you paid to Iran would be very well appreciated. As I said in the introduction, a number of your uh, blogs, a number of your articles have been translated in Pers to Persian, but having a video with subtitles is a different story because I'm afraid many people would prefer to see it this way. So we are very grateful for your presence. And um, I think it will be viewed by a lot of people after this, both on live stream, but also once we add the edited version of the file to the YouTube channel. And I will keep you up to date. I hope this won't be the last time we will have you, we will, I hope in a couple of months we can have you as a guest again. And both Torab and I would like to thank you very much for, and all the admins, we'd like to thank you very much for doing this talk. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really been good. The questions have been excellent. I hope I've been able to answer them to the best I can. 
and that you've we've all got something out of this because I certainly have. Yeah, yeah, we all learned a lot. Thanks very much. And some of the text for those comrades who are still online, Michael and I are working so that we produce this as a critique article, maybe in the next few weeks. And once that's there, we'll add the link to the article to uh, the website for Voice of Iranian Revolutionism. Thank you very much, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.